Hey guys, how's it going? I was supposed to do a joke about Bitcoin X, so should I do it or not? <laughs> what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, Bitcoin X? So send me your money for my ICO and we'll raise like a couple of million dollars together. So uh, this is pretty much a phishing attempt to get your money, which is some of the time that we're going to discuss in this talk. So who am I? Uh, I work at Mandian, a FireEye company. I'm doing red team, uh, web application testing, internal, external, and stuff like that. I really enjoy writing assembly. Some people think I'm crazy because of that, but I guess I love it. Love to bypass stuff. So this is something that you have to do when you perform red team because your client may have security product uh, on the way, so you have to figure out a way to go through them. Uh, I've been with the NordSec for four years now. Uh, I'm a native French Quebecois, which explained my terrible accent. It's all actually my parents' fault, not mine, so blame them for that. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, uh, the goal of a red team, because there's a lot of misconception about red team. Again, this is my personal opinion, so I could be wrong, you could be right. It's a question of point of view. Uh, identifying your target. So when you're targeting a company, what we should do and a couple of tricks to actually find interesting value that can really help you doing a red team. Phishing, so a couple of advice that I personally use when I perform phishing. Which kind of payload you should use in certain specific situation. And hunting, this is again not a complete things about red team because we don't have like 12 hours to talk about it. But I'll give you some of the tips that I personally use when I perform red team. And a couple of tools and tips at the end uh, regarding red teaming. So first of all, goal of red team. Obviously, you want to assess your client responsiveness, uh, responsiveness against red actors. Usually, when you perform an internal penetration testing, you're going to run like an automated scan that's going to give you a big picture of everything they have in their network and a bunch of unpatched software and stuff like that. Usually, red teamers not going to run automated tools because we want to assess if they're able to actually detect us. So we're trying to be a bit more quiet over the network. So we provide different kind of feedback. Uh, evaluating their security posture, uh, we're usually going to define goals with the client. So access the CEO email, for example, getting a domain admin access or targeting specific application that contain like the, the, the real good asset, like customer information and stuff like that, right? And also trying to demonstrate the kind of path that an attacker can actually use to get access to this information because most of the time we're going to define domain admin as a, as a goal, but we don't necessarily need domain admin to actually get access to really valuable assets, right? What red team is not about? Exploiting as many OD as possible. To me, a red team is most likely a sysadmin job. So you get your first foothold, then you just have to understand your environment and figure out who have the, the access to the specific application that you want to target, right? And again, it's also not exploiting as much system as possible because you want to remain stealth. So sometimes I've conducted red team where I only had two shells for the whole things and it was enough to actually achieve all the goals. So that's perfect for you because you can remain, remain pretty stealth. So if you make the analogy between internal testing and red team, uh, internal testing most like Rambo, you're shooting everywhere and you're just trying to actually get shells everywhere. And it's usually a little bit more easier to, to get the main admin that way, but it's extremely noisy and it's not something that you can do when you perform red team. Red team is more like James Bond, you're more still, a little bit more sexy of the network. Usually your payload is going to be a bit more sophisticated than just like using your muscle to shoot everywhere. But the realest question, are we really sexy and stealthy as James Bond when we perform web team? We're going to discover that some of the techniques that we use are not necessarily as stealth as we thought, unfortunately. And that's one of the things that I want to address, just give you insight of trick that I use to actually be a bit more stealth. Unfortunately, there's no magic way to get data without being detected at some point, because that's how it works, right? You need to fetch data. So at some points, you need to establish connection to a specific service, at least. So let's move on to identify your, your target. First of all, you need a list of targets, right? So are you going to fish employees, specific type of employees? Let's say you're looking for an insurance company. Are you going to target the, the insurance claim guys that have limited access? Or are you going to try to go to the manager or people with a little bit more privilege? It may be interesting because they may have specific program internally that can be, that can be used 
for a better fishing campaign, uh, identifying their security product. Even if you don't have a foothold, there's sometimes some insight that you can get to actually identify this kind of information and pick the right fishing campaign for your target. We'll discuss about this a bit later. I'll give you a perfect example. This is actually a real, a real screenshot from a real client. Um, that was a fairly new company, so they didn't have much uh, email that were leaking, data breach and stuff like that, which is a good place to find a couple of emails for your target company. However, they were really active on Facebook, so they were posting picture in their office with a bunch of people, and they tag every single employee on the picture. Finding the email pattern is usually something simple. You need to find one or two, and you're going to understand that this is their email pattern. So I basically crafted emails based on their name on Facebook. Again, bonus points, some of these people were actually putting their job on Facebook. So it was even easier for me to figure out that this person was an underwriter at the company or doing something else. So you can select your target more efficiently. So looking at Facebook is really a good idea if you're looking for a potential name for a specific company if you don't get much email through public, uh, public channel. Uh, as I mentioned, searching publicly available password dump, like there's a couple of huge dump like Adobe, Ashley Madison, and a bunch of other in the past that can actually give you a bunch of email address that can be used. You don't really care about that, but the password, you're mostly going to fish those people, right? So you just reuse this information. GitHub, you'll be surprised how many dev actually put their email in the author and they're actually a company. And there's an incident a couple of months ago that happened with a company that actually had uh, emails leaked through their GitHub, and they also leak internal password that way. So you can even find passwords sometimes for free. Basebin, same idea. People may just put some things to share with a friend, and they kind of forget that it's public sometimes and indexed by Google. So you can also uh, find it that way. Another really good thing is OWA. Actually, OWA is the devil, pretty much. You can do a lot of amazing stuff with OWA. There's most companies are not moving to Office 365, which is the cloud version of it, but there's still super cool feature. Uh, OWA on-premise, you can actually leak the GAL, which is the global uh, address list, which contains all the employees. All you need is a password, right? But it's not really hard because people tend to have terrible password. So one of the things that you can do, brute force their password. So assume that you found a list of email, use the good old uh, season plus the year, so uh, spring 2018, and just spray it against all of them. And you're probably going to find at least one or two accounts. Doesn't really matter if they're privileged or not, because you can use this, this credential to actually get to the, the service, which actually have the filter, to get people filtered, that going to provide you the list of all their employees. So from there, you can just restart the whole process, but with all of their, uh, their uh, active directory, which is fairly interesting. Cool thing, uh, even if MFA is enabled, so multi-factor authentication is enabled, it's still going to work without it. It's uh, basically just support basic authentication, so it's fairly easy to script it. There's a bunch of tools online that actually do that for you. So targeting OWA is really lucrative. Same approach with Office 365. There is a public uh, API that you can use that achieve pretty much the same thing. So again, you just have to leak a couple of emails, and you can query the API and find the information. Again, you can also perform pr password brute force on auto discovery, which is a public domain for all the, the, the cloud client. And most of the time, clients don't get inside of the kind of attack that are performed against this, this domain because it's owned by Microsoft. So it may take a bit of time before they actually realize that their ADFS is actually being brought forth externally because nobody look at, look at their logs, right? Do you? I don't, personally. Showdown is also really useful. You'll be surprised how many uh, good old uh, Citrix portal OAuth VPN are actually publicly exposed by your targets. Just use Shodan, all the information is there. You're gonna get all what you need. And if it's not a multi-factor authentication, usually uh, by using the previous information that you got by forcing password through OWA, you may find a valuable employee that have a Citrix portal access to a specific application. And from, from there, you can try to do Citrix uh, escape and stuff like that and basically get a shell inside of their own network without even having to fish the whole company, which is fairly interesting because the most critical part is usually the phishing. This is where you have to interact with the user, so you have better chance of being detected at that specific step. 
So that's a good cool trick. And as I told you, the good old summer 2012, uh, 2018 always going to work, unfortunately, because it's compliant even if your uh, password policy is enforced. Except nobody enforced the special character policy on Active Directory. So even if you s know for a fact that your, your client is enforcing that, just had a bang at the end, and you're still going to get success, unfortunately. And that's a fact. That's the sad part of it. I'm not even joking. So you want to uh, identify which kind of security product your clients have? There's a couple of tricks like that. Most of the security products tend to be verbose. They, they kind of want to show you that they're there and they're really proud of being there. So they're usually going to have a bunch of information that you can actually use. So trying to find an email that is not used anymore, so it has been deactivated by your targeted corp, and send an email to that client. Of course, it's going to bounce back saying that the user does not exist anymore. And look at the uh, S uh, SMTP header. You'll be really surprised of all the information that you can find. Here's just three simple examples. The first one is the Microsoft technology. So you have like the reputation of the email, and you can confirm that everything is good and didn't detect anything shady with your payload. And even there, you can notify that they don't have SPF enabled, which is another bad thing. Second one is proof point, and you have the scoring of your, your email. So if you're scoring badly, maybe you should adapt your phishing campaign a bit to make sure that you're going to score better before doing the actual phishing campaign against your client. Last one, good old McAfee. So again, you can know for a fact that they use McAfee technology on the, side, on the other side, and you can kind of adapt your phishing uh, email to make sure that you're not going to be detected by the solution that they use. Another simple example. LinkedIn, it's your friend. Just look for the kind of job that they're offering. You, it may help you. So if they're looking for Splunk Admin, Palo Alto, or ArcSide, for example, you kind of know what they're probably using on the other side. So again, you can adapt your payload based on this information. Uh, also, their corporate uh, website is really useful to get ideas. Most big companies now, they have like royalty program internally, or they involve in like uh, a charity, uh, charity um, program and stuff like that. So if you know for a fact that there's an upcoming event in a month, let's say, you can decide to make a phishing campaign based out of this. So it's kind of good in time because it makes sense for them to receive email about that at that specific time. Or if they have loyalty program, you can claim that you changed something in the loyalty program and you have to subscribe there and provide your Active Directory credential on a third party website, right? It's 100% legitimate. So at that point, let's assume that we, there's a bunch of other way to actually perform this part, but let's assume that we collected a, a good list of email, we have a good idea of our target. Let's move to the actual phishing campaign itself. So here's a couple of rules that I personally follow when I do phishing campaign. The first one, never put your malicious payload in the email. That's really important because you don't get any visibility, and I'll cover this a little bit more in details uh, afterward. Uh, don't, allow, uh, don't allow automated solution to have insight into your final search. So if you know a way to actually prevent automated tools to actually fetch your payload, do it. It's always going to benefit you. Use categorized demand. It's super easy to get categorized demand, and you know for a fact that you're going to go through most proxy that way, so you don't even have to worry that your C2 server may just be not authorized in, by the corporate proxy. Use HTTPS. There's no reason of not doing it. You're just going to blend with the, the rest of the encrypted traffic. Uh, be boring as much as possible. And I know that a lot of people don't agree with me on this one, but I personally strongly believe that you should make your phishing campaign as boring as possible and as much corporate as possible. Just personally, I really enjoy the code of conduct thing. Just here, here's a code of conduct update. Please uh, read it and approve it. Nobody's going to do it. Nobody care. But you're always going to get one or two person that's finally going to do it. It may take like two days before you get your shell, but at least they're just going to ignore it. If you offer some, some things to people, usually they're going to be more trill and they're going to look at the email and say, oh yeah, I got 50 bucks or something like that in Amazon cart. So they're really going to look at the email and feel like they're, they're looking for someone. So they may catch up and take a look at the email again and may realize that it's fishy and may potentially raise an alarm. Especially nowadays, there's a lot of companies that have a phishing button built in in like Outlook, for example, so it's fairly easy now to report. Uh, using uh, typo squatting nowadays, I think it's a really bad idea because it's a bit more fishy and we're living in everything as a services era. 
So for us, it's pretty common to see like a subdomain, like company subdomains such as fireeye.whatever, thirdparty.com, because this is now how the internet works. So having this is more legit than like a fireeye with three E, for example. And don't reuse your domain. As a, as a red teamer and as a company, some of your sample may end up on VirusTotal because a client may cut you and they may try to analyze it. So you may actually just leak other client information that way and it's not something that you want to do. So malicious payload. You don't have any inside if it's inside of your payload. You don't know if it was fetched. You don't know which kind of solution potentially fetch it. You have zero control over it. So one of the things that you should do is always put a link that point to a website where your payload is hosted. Um, if like, they have a solution that actually fetch your payload, you're going to know for a fact that the solution fetched the website so you can fingerprint the IP address and maybe correlate this IP address with the company. If there's something wrong with your payload for whatever reason, it's easier for you to swap it because you can just change the, the, the content of the website on the fly without having to send new phishing campaign with new links. So this is a perfect example. As I mentioned, I'm a personal huge fan of code of conduct update. So you just say, hi, Bob. We currently updated uh, our code of conduct policy. Please just review and accept as soon as possible. And you provide this super corporate link, right, with the UID at the end so you can track your user. That's, that's something that's really important because if you know for a fact that this ID was tied to a specific user and you see like three different IP fetching the same payload, you're probably, you're probably facing an automated product that is actually trying to understand what's going on with your email. So it may raise a red flag on your side. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, email, the, the, the URL format is a bit complex and it tends to be corporate because most of these third party actually have super impossible uh, uh, URL schemes. So I personally use uh, Write Engine uh, re mod rewrite engine to simply create whatever link I want. So this is a perfect example of a rule that I use, which basically doesn't matter what you put in the DRL, it's just always going to redirect to index.php. So you can be as creative as you want. Sometimes I'm even enjoying myself by just adding like ASPX extension, even if it's a PHP server. But it's, I don't know, H ASPX sounds more corporate to me than PHP most of the time. So it may actually convince people, like the devil is in the details, this says, right? So this is a perfect example of like making corporate URL. Rule number two, as I told you, don't allow automated tool to actually fetch your final payload. Um, this is a trick that I love a lot. I basically generate the link using JavaScript. Simple as that, because 99% of those products don't actually parse JavaScript. So this is a typical website. So you have your link that point to this website, and the website have a link to this shady word-enabled macro document and you just click on it. So most of the, the tools actually gonna parse the HTML and found the link and actually get to the payload. And they're gonna analyze it and potentially maybe detect you. So if there's a way to actually hide this URL, why not doing it? And JavaScript is exactly the tools that you need. You basically create the link, which is an empty link. So when they're gonna crawl the website, they're not gonna find anything and they're just gonna forget about this link and says, yeah, there's nothing shady here. That's a perfectly fine website. However, you have your little piece of JavaScript at the end that basically create the location and um, actually uh, fill the URL for you. And bonus point in this case, as you can see the last line, I'm gonna force the click. And phishing is always about the user interaction. If your user enjoyed the experience, it's gonna most likely follow through the path. So if you force the download pop-up for him, it's even better, right? He doesn't even have to click on the link. So there's more, more chance that he's actually gonna click and download it. So by doing the click action, you're just gonna fetch the page and you're gonna be prompted with the download. So that's perfect, right? That's convenient. And Sandbox not gonna be able to see that because it's JavaScript generated link. Use categorize demand. Fairly simple. There's a bunch of websites that are already categorized. Personally, I use this little, uh, this little tool, which is like a four-liner of Bash, which just clone a website and change the base so I can clone a website, which is an exact copy of the original one, and send it to categorizers such as like Bluco, which is actually now Symantec, and a bunch of other company. So they're just gonna categorize your domain because yeah, it's a legitimate, well-known domain. After that, you're good to go, and you can use this domain for phishing or for your C2 uh, connection. You can also unbox for expired domain if you're lazy, like, like me. So I just wrote this little tool a couple of years ago, which goes on expired domain, and you just give a keyword, and it's gonna list a bunch of domain that are actually expired, 
and you can buy them if they're available. So you can find already categorized demand. And that's another thing. This, there's some some product security product company that actually going to look at the date of registration. So if this demand was there forever, you may actually bypass this check and they're going to say, oh yeah, this demand has been around for like 10 years, so it's probably safe. Because if you just buy the demand two days ago, register it, and they see it in their network, they're going to put a red flag on it. Like this domain is, fresh, is freshly registered. It may be shady, right? So this approach can help you with that too. Rule number four, use HTTPS with a valid certificate. Let's Encrypt is free. Um, right now, unfortunately, not the whole web is actually using this, but I'm pretty sure over time, most of the internet probably gonna use Let's Encrypt because it's free. So right now, I've seen some company that actually put a red flag when it's Let's Encrypt because they know it's free and a lot of bad guys are actually using it. But in the future, I'm pretty sure that most of the company are gonna rely on Let's Encrypt, so you're just gonna be another guy with Let's Encrypt. But you can also afford a, a paid certificate with like a Rapid SSL or all of the other uh, providers. And bonus point for Let's Encrypt, you don't even have to validate yourself. If you go with corporate solution for certificate, they're gonna ask you a bunch of information and I don't like lying on the internet, so I feel like providing f fake information is not something that's really good. Number five, being boring as possible. Again, as I discussed earlier, if, you're, if your client have expectation, they're most likely gonna reread the email again. And remember the last time yeah, you have an email saying, hey, you got this 50% discount. I'm pretty sure that most of you look at the URL and say, uh, that may be fishy, is it something's weird, like they're offering me money or discount on something, why? Is it a phishing campaign? But if I send you this good old, hey, can you f please complete your timesheet? You're like, one month uh, due and you didn't fill your timesheet, please just do it and log into the, the interfaces. A, you're, you're gonna hate it, but you're still gonna do it because it's corporate, right? And you wanna be a good employee. So that's a perfect example of boring phishing campaign. And personally, I had better success with boring campaign than like those super cool campaign where you're gonna get everything you want if you subscribe there. Uh, typo squatting, like for example, nordsex.io vs nordsex.canadianevent.com, right? If you look at it real fast, it kind of looks legitimate. It may be a real domain, but if you're taking a look at it, it's obviously a typo squatting because we're not a nordsex event, we're a nordsec. But if you look at nordsec.canadianevent.com, it looks way more legitimate, right? It's probably just a Canadian website that have a list of all the Canadian events, for example. We don't know, it sounds legitimate, and nordsec is spelled correctly, which is another good thing, because this is what we're, we're used to. And if you look at third party, for example, you'll see. Just tomorrow, uh, on Monday, when you get back to job, look at, at your job, look how many different subdomains you're using that are not even related to your company. You'll be actually pretty impressed by how many subdomains you're gonna see that are not even related to you. Number seven, don't reuse your domain for other project. Your payload may end up on VirusTotal because some of your client may detect you, you never know, and you may actually leak other client information, especially if you're using your client name as a subdomain. So they may found the NS record and stuff like that, which is not something that you want because you wanna be transparent about that, obviously. Payload, so at that point, we, we prepare a phishing campaign. We're ready to send a payload to, to our victim. So I'm just gonna take a sip of water before the payload. So the phishing campaign is almost ready. We just need to put a payload inside our phishing campaign. Uh, nowadays, there's a classic approach uh, act differently if you're in front of a security product, which is basically evading sandboxes. But they realized it was not necessarily a, an efficient model, so they moved to endpoint solution, right? So your client is actually the sandbox itself. But we still found a lot of clients actually have like inline sandbox, so if you can just stop the execution on those sandbox, you're good to go. But there's also a couple of little tricks that you can use on the endpoint to kind of defeat the, uh, the detection. So I'll cover some of the uh, example that I actually personally do when I do phishing campaign. Uh, just to be clear, I'm gonna define my definition of obfuscation and uh, evasion. Uh, if you look at the variable equals three, it's the original code, right? The concept of obfuscating code is to actually have the same result, but 
written differently. So instead of just putting three, I'm going to obfuscate it and change it to one plus two. So th the result is the same, but if they're performing static analysis and they're looking for the malicious three, in this case, they're not going to see the three, right? That's the idea. If you're doing evasion, you're going to use specific condition to actually hack differently. So in this case, let's say if context equals sandbox, so we're fingerprinting the sandbox in a certain way, Okay, fine, you can do three. If it's, if it's not the case, just exit. So in this case, the code never gonna run. And most sandbox will say, yeah, your code is fine. We didn't detect anything suspicious. Uh, being trendy is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, for you guys that do Red Team, you're probably mostly using PowerShell script nowadays because it's the new cool thing. But if you remember a couple of years ago when we used to use Metasploit and all the, the Metasploit modules that were mostly executable in DLL, we're still achieving the same thing, it's just a different way. But vendor also followed the trend, right? So right now, most of the detection are based out of PowerShell. They're working really hard on detecting PowerShell as much as they can because that's, every, that's what people use now. What was the last time that you actually heard about someone saying, here's the new cool detection against binary? They don't really care because most people move to PowerShell. So if you, have, if you come up with other ways of actually executing code on your target, it may actually be super good for you because the chance of being detected are a bit lower. So first advice for the payloads, don't run PowerShell directly. All the vendors are gonna dis detect you in a second because they know that you're gonna use PowerShell. So the minute that you actually start the PowerShell process, they're gonna detect you. They have different level of detection, but there was a tool that I wrote a couple of years ago which is called Powerless Shell, which is using a technique that was well documented in the past that used the, uh, that use C Sharp to actually create a run space environment and execute PowerShell without actually using the PowerShell ex binary itself. So if you use that, you're gonna run whatever PowerShell you want without having to bother uh, executing the PowerShell, uh, uh, PowerShell process itself. If you're using macro, for example, uh, the well-known technique is to rely on wscript.shell uh, or the, f the, the function called shell itself. Uh, the big issue with that is when we're gonna actually spawn a process, a child process that is gonna be like CMD or whatever you run. And most of the system gonna detect the child process of WinWord, which is not what you want, right? The solution that I come up with is use WMI through, through WinExec, so uh, through your uh, macro, sorry. The idea is your child process not gonna be tied to uh, WinWord, it's actually gonna be tied to WMI SCPR service, which is actually the WMI service. So there's no link between the execution of your payload and the Word document itself. And I have another tool for that, which is malicious macro generator that generate terribly obfuscated macro that are super useful when you wanna fish people. Again, uh, if you're planning to use signed binary, be careful. Again, because they all know about it. It's super trendy. A lot of people discuss about it on Twitter and they post examples. So it's a matter of hours sometimes before the vendor is actually going to have the new rules for those well-known binary. Like Regis VR32 was a well-known binary where you can specify a rel to a, uh, a com object that you control and it's going to download it and execute it. So you'd, you're using like uh, whitelisted signed Windows binary to actually run your code, right? However, um, I got some insight about the fact that some people found a way to actually run these binary and modify the code, but they're gonna remind sign. So I actually wrote a little script that modified the hash of those signed binary, but it's still, they're still gonna remain signed by Microsoft. So even if you change the data, it's still gonna remain signed. So it's fairly interesting because you're still signed, so if your endpoint solution is blacklisting everything that is not signed by Microsoft, you're passing that check, but if they also look at the hash of well-known bad signed uh, binary, you're also gonna pass this check, so usually you can actually execute your code using this. The only downside is you have to drop this binary on the system, but it's still something that you can do, so your first stage can be drop this signed binary that was modified like Regis VR32, for example, so you drop your modified version of Regis VR32, and you actually run the same type of exploit, but with this slightly modified version, and they may not detect you. Another trick that worked with some, some product, again, they have different level of detection, just rename it. 
powershell.exe to something random. Some of them are not even bothering looking at the, the hash of the binary that you're running. They're just going to look at the name. So just rename it and do your things, and it's still going to work perfectly. Again, you can do it inside of your macro because some software, again, may actually detect that you're going to run the command copy PowerShell and rename it. So just do it inside of your macro if you're using macro as your first uh, attack vector. It's fairly simple. Just copy file, source destination, and you're good to go. Uh, you should always put a condition in your code to ev evade sandbox. You never know. Maybe even if your uh, OSN didn't reveal any specific security product, just do it. It costs nothing, and it may save your life. Uh, perfect example, when I use click once, uh, the way that click once work, at the end of the day, it's just uh, an executable, but Microsoft come up with a super cool, user-friendly way of delivering them through uh, Internet Explorer. So you click on the link, and you have this super like cool, fancy setup that just starts, so people feel like, I guess, it's more safe that way, right, for whatever reason. But if your payload is fetched by a security product, they're usually just going to get the binary, and they're going to run it. So an easy check for click once, check if Internet Explorer is actually running. Because if there's a click once running on the system and ex Internet Explorer is not open, it's impossible. Like there's something shady going on, you're probably like in a sandbox or something like that. So in this case, in C Sharp, you can just check for the process. And if, if it's the case, if Internet Explorer is running, just you can be evil as much as you want after that. Again, I have a tool which is called Click Once Generator that allow you to generate those fancy Click Once heavily obfuscated things, and you have all the option to actually specify which kind of process you want to look for. Another one that is really interesting to look for is Outlook. Obviously, if you know for a fact that you're using the fat client, so if someone's actually reading your email and Outlook is not open, again, it sounds a bit shady to me. Payload again. Sometimes you have issue and you're facing a specific client and you have to come up with a solution because you know that they're going to detect this specific type of payload. So sometimes, time to time, I just write tools to actually try to evade them. So the first one is for a scum scriptlet, so SCT file. If you want to use like Cobalt Strike or Empire built in a, um, SCT file, you can just uh, send the file through SCT obfuscator and it's just going to make it a bit more obfuscated and usually you're good to go. Uh, UniBAV is actually an EXE uh, uh, obfuscator, obfuscator, sorry, and it just takes shellcode and going to generate an EXE for you that is heavily obfuscated and you should be good to go again. It also support a bunch of evasion uh, modules so you can actually specify which module you want to use. Uh, don't kill my cat. Uh, I presented that tool last year uh, at the Nordtech. Actually, it's relying on polyglot images. So it's a 100% valid image, but it's also a 100% valid shellcode if you start from the first byte of the image. So over the network, you're just going to see an image. And most of the sandbox product don't really care about an image, right? Because they don't want to lose their CPU cycle analyzing a legitimate image, right? Uh, for PowerShell, uh, there's my friend that is actually presenting at the same time from FireEye. He wrote Invoke Obfuscation. He's actually presenting DOS Obfuscation as we speak. And this is a heavy framework that, that had obfuscation to your, your code. But if you're using Cobol Strike or Empire, you may realize that most of the time, if you have the one-liner, it's just going to be a one-liner of base64 encoded, right? And most of the product now, they actually fingerprint that specific path. So I just wrote a little simple tools that actually obfuscate the base64 itself. So it's more convenient for this kind of specific tools. But feel free to just take a look at my GitHub and just see how it works. If you're interested in more details, I can provide you after uh, the presentation. Uh, problem with the sandbox, they're fingerprintable and predictable, right? Because you know for a fact that this is not a real environment. This is something that is faking uh, an environment and trying to see what's going on with your, uh, with your malware. So there's a lot of tricks that you can actually use to prevent your code to run on sandboxes. For example, look at the memory size. If it's more, less than four gig, you're probably not living in the. You're probably living in the past if it's less than four gigs, or you're a sandbox because nowadays four gigs on a computer is is pretty legitimate. Same with the disk size. If you have less than 250 gigs of disk size, you're probably not a legitimate computer. You're just a sandbox. Again, there are some sandbox that have like that fake this information, but there's other way to, to, to look at that. You can also look at the hook that they've created. Number of CPU, same thing. I think that I don't even know if it's possible to buy a single CPU anymore. Probably not. You're probably going to have at least two core. So that's another thing that you can check. I'm assuming even four is probably good in 2018. 
Again, as I mentioned, look for a specific process running. If you're phishing someone and you don't see Outlook EXE running, that's probably not your original target. Uh, difference between endpoint and uh, your actual uh, sandbox, network access. Is your sandbox have network access? That's another easy one. Oh yeah, here's my payload and you don't have network access. How my payload actually ended up there? So that's some things that you can assess pretty easily. Uh, if you're targeting a company, usually they're going to be joined to the domain. So you can check if the, the current user that is running your payload is joined to a domain. If it's not the case, that's probably not, again, the target that you're looking for, time zone. Uh, if you're targeting a Canadian um, company and you know exactly on which, when, on which time zone they are, there's no reason to have like a weird time zone in a different country, right? So it may be another sign of you're running your code in a shady environment. Detecting hook, uh, there's a bunch of uh, sandboxes that actually have hooks and they're going to fake some, some uh, answers. So if you ask for a specific Windows API, they may force an answer, but there's actually a, a way to actually detect hook. So you can actually detect that the function was hook and just abort if it's the case. Uptime, for example, if you're targeting someone uh, during the after launch and the computer was open for like five seconds, maybe it's another shady sandbox that just fired up. Activities, look at the clipboard, look at the, the, the tr network traffic that you're receiving. If the clipboard is empty, that may be the case, but usually people are like copy pasting stuff all day long. So if it's empty, that's another good sign of the fact that you're probably looking at a sandbox right now. And there's like billions of other techniques and we can talk about this for probably six hours, but be creative. That's the key. And don't be, don't be shy to actually play with those sandboxes and trying to figure out how they work. You're going to benefit from that. Rule number five, uh, connecting back to your C2 as stealthy as possible. There's a lot of techniques that were publicly now, uh, the publicly disclosed uh, lately, like domain fronting. So use a legitimate domain to actually front your C2 domain is something quite cool because your client going to see traffic to a legitimate, let's say, Microsoft website. And from there, you can actually send the data back to your C2. So it's kind of hard to actually figure out what's going on from a higher perspective, a little bit harder at least. Uh, categorize domain again, I think we, we covered this one pretty well. Enforce HTTPS again, there's no reason for you to not use HTTPS. You're going to blend into the rest of the, the HTTPS traffic. And the, most companies don't perform SSL interception, so they're, they're going to have zero visibility on what's going on. Uh, also, select legitimate protocol. Uh, in the past, like Metasploit, if you look, for example, they used to, uh, to do all the traffic over raw TCP that was actually encrypted. But most rats now, they actually move to HTTP because they just want to blend into legitimate traffic. So again, using HTTP for your own rat is probably a good idea if you want to write your own. Which brings me to Thundershell, which is a rat that I wrote uh, a couple of months ago. And again, it was to solve an issue on a specific engagement. Um, one of the idea that we, uh, the, the issue that we had is the endpoint solution was actually analyzing the, the network traffic use the, uh, using a mini filter, which is basically a, a filter that you can put on the network traffic. So even if you use HTTPS, when it hit the, the target, the traffic is going to be decrypted at the OS level, right? So you still have visibility on the clear text traffic. So if you have your stager, they're actually going to see it in clear. So the solution was to come up with a second layer of encryption that is not performed at the OS level, but at the software level. So Thundershell is actually encrypting everything using RC4. So when the target receives the traffic, it's, R it's RC4 encrypted, which doesn't give any information to the, the mini filter because it's just gibberish. And the PowerShell rat actually performed the decryption at that point. So the network has no visibility on this actual traffic. Another thing that I wanted to address is the fact that most of these rats have a second stage. So you have, you're going to have your shellcode, which is the first shellcode that's going to fetch the remote DLL or EXE that's going to be loaded in memory, then it's going to be uh, executed. The problem with that is most of these solutions are actually going to send the second stage clear over network. So you're going to see like this shady Cobalt Strike DLL going through the network, which is not necessarily something that you want. So by doing uh, RC4 encryption and avoiding having a second stage, you're pretty much good to go again. So this is basically a, the schema of how uh, the Tanisha rat works. So you use RC4 encryption, send over HTTPS, Windows decrypt the HTTPS stream, then the network is at that position and PowerShell rat actually decrypt the RC4 after the hook was set. So they have zero visibility. 
Uh, again, it just down doesn't download the second stage, which is a good thing. And if, feel free to contribute to the project. I wish it can become something useful for, for more than just me. So if you feel I'm actually working on a web UI right now to make it as much convenient as possible, but feel free to actually join me in that project if you're interested. It will be a pleasure to work with you. Choose the right payload. Uh, for example, if you look at Office 2016, by default, the macro is disabled. So you can try as hard as you want. The client not going to be able to actually run it. So try to avoid macro if you know for a fact that your client is using Office 2016. HTA, it's super powerful, but it's also highly detected because it's extremely trendy. A lot of people talk about it, and it's fairly cool. A click once requires the use of Internet Explorer. And I've hit a case where the, the, sh the whole shop was using Google Chrome, and they didn't know how to use Internet Explorer, so they were just trying to load the click once using uh, Chrome, which was not really successful for me. Plain tech EXE may be blocked by application whitelisting, so depending on which kind of fingerprint you manage to do on your client, you may actually avoid uh, using one of these specific um, uh, payload because you're going to get detected or it's actually just not going to run. Uh, again, avoid running PowerShell directly too because it's extremely trendy. So for example, instead of doing macro that actually launch a WMI that one launch PowerShell, use macro that launch WMI that actually use PowerShell less to uh, load the, the PowerShell without actually ever invo invoking PowerShell.exe. That's those little things that actually make a huge difference at the end of the day between being detected or not. So at this point, we carefully crafted our phishing campaign and our payload, so we're pretty much ready to go, right? So good news, everyone. We have a shell at that point. So it's time for hunting. So now we have access. We need to gather as much information as possible. And usually, you never know. Maybe you think you, you, went, you went through and you were super cell, but they actually have good detection, and they actually detected you. So as fast as possible, I'm always going to try to fetch as much information about the internal user base. So I'm going to fetch the username, the email, and everything I can to make sure that I can collect this information and potentially redo a phishing campaign later on with a bigger pool of information. So again, avoid using uh, running PowerShell directly. Avoid using net family command because there's a lot of detection-based rules that are purely based on the function that you're going to call. So if you call net user or something, there's a good chance that you may be detected if they have detection for that. Uh, try to avoid connecting to all system at the same time if it's possible, because it's pretty bad and super noisy. Uh, the solution, uh, if you want to get the information as fast as possible, uh, personally, I use unmanaged PowerShell plus LDAP query. You can just send an LDAP query to the Active Directory and get all the information. For Cobalt Strike, PowerPick is the equivalent of, of managed PowerShell, and it's built in. So there's no reason to not doing it. Tondershell, by default, support this, too. So every time that, every time that you're actually invoking PowerShell, you're actually using the uh, unmanaged PowerShell idea. So if you look at this script, uh, I have a commandlet, which is called dump user email, which actually just ended up doing a uh, a LDAP query. So it's going to look for all the users in the LDAP directory and get the mail property. That's all. You're going to get all the, e the the mail without having to use SMB or anything else. You're just going to query LDAP directly. And this is usually some things that company do not monitor. Uh, same with username. You want all the username, same query, just different property. There's other options like more that can provide you more information about uh, the users that you're looking for. If you're feeling a bit more in, more uh, crazy, if I can put it that way, you can actually try to brute force users. After you fetch the list of users, if you feel like you want to brute force all of these users, why not? So I actually wrote another script that allow you to uh, pass a list of user and the password. And the cool thing about this script is you can actually if brute force user in another forest inside of the, the, in, the enterprise. You just have to specify the domain that you're looking for. So you can be in domain A and actually brute force users in domain B. Works pretty well. It's obviously a bit more noisy because every time you're trying to uh, a login attempt, you're going to generate an event. Of course, try to avoid uh, brute forcing more than two times the same user because you may lock all the account. It, this is not something super uh, stealth, especially if you don't want to be detected. But it can be really useful if you're running out of idea at the end of a red team that didn't went super well. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, the, the brute force thing rely on a validate credential, which is a built-in functionality in Windows. 
and it just connects to the DC and ask if the credential are valid or not. That's all. Um, if you're looking for a specific SAM account name, let's say you're, you went on LinkedIn and you found this specific user that seems to be really interesting. Uh, there's actually a little script that I, again, wrote, which is called search full name to SAM account. You just provide a name, and they're going to return the information that it's actually inside of the Active Directory again. So in this case, I'll, I search for myself inside of the FireEye domain. And as you can see, I just specify Hamilton, and my name come out. So you can get the SAM account name, and you can potentially try to find where this actually is actually currently logged in based on the SAM account name, right? Uh, there's a really cool feature. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, tools such as Invoke User Hunter, which basically connect as to much uh, to as to assets that it's actually alive in the network, and they're gonna try to see who's actually running on the system, right? It's super useful, but extremely noisy too. This technique is a bit less uh, less stale. It only connects to the main controller and look for the event log and the logon event for the user that you're targeting. The only downside is that you need to have domain admin access at that point. However, usually the way that I'm proceeding is my first goal is to get domain admin, and from there I'm gonna move to specific target that have access to the application I'm targeting. So at that point in my red team, I already have domain admin, so it's not really an issue for me. So you just specify your user and wait for the event log to show up, and you're gonna have a bunch of uh, like log on event that show you the source IP so you can easily find where the user is actually uh, connected at the moment so you can target that system later on. Browser bookmark is really useful too. Uh, by default, they may push this information their bookmark so all their corporate uh, asset may be actually found in the bookmark. So if you're looking for their intranet and stuff like that, you may actually find it there. Again, there's another little PowerShell script that can do that for you. Uh, w Digest. Uh, Mimi cats sometimes may not work because they may have prevented W Digest to, to, to be stored in memory. Uh, the cool thing about PowerShell, by default, it supports Kerberos ticket. So if you have uh, access to PowerShell, you actually have access to the current user Kerberos ticket. And I wrote a little script which is called remote WMI execute that allow you to execute command on a remote host using your current user uh, Kerberos ticket. So assuming that the user that you currently have access to have access to other system, such as a local admin user or something like that, you can just leverage that power to move laterally on the network without actually knowing any one password. There is a little downside about uh, Kerberos tickets sometimes. Even if you have a Kerberos ticket, you're gonna get access denied. Uh, there is a catch-22 with the Kerberos ticket. It depends on which process you're actually using. Your Kerberos ticket may not be in refresh, so it's just gonna time out and never gonna be actually renewed. So it's really important to actually pick the right uh, process when you're performing that kind of task. So especially if you're using WMI, this is one of the, the, the process that actually gonna not necessarily renew your, your Kerberos ticket. So one of the things that I do, again, it's a bit noisy, but sometimes we have to be noisy to make sure that we're in a good position. I'm gonna migrate to Explorer. So I'm gonna inject myself into Explorer and impersonate everything that it's running under the Explorer context. I'm also gonna enter it from the uh, Kerberos ticket, obviously. So that's, a, that's my go-to process, but unfortunately, Explorer is not a process that really performs network traffic, so it's some things that it's shady. Apparently, uh, on Windows 10 now, Explorer is actually having tabs and do perform networks, uh, network um, connections, so it makes this technique a bit less shady. Uh, again, from an offset perspective, it's not necessarily the best process to use. However, there's more stealthy target that you can use, such as SVC, also to kind of that or process that actually perform network traffic, so keep that in mind in the future. So you can migrate to these process and it's a bit more stale because they're known to perform network traffic. Uh, Active Directory contain a lot of valuable information. Uh, there's probably like two or 300 fields for each user, so you'll be surprised of all the information that you can find. And I actually have a bunch of utility that can uh, dump the comment, the description, and you'll be surprised how many times we found actual art coded password in the command for like service account and stuff like that. So just dump all the comments and you'll be surprised. Sometimes, hey, don't change this password for this specific uh, service account. And usually having a service account is really useful from a red team perspective. 
There's also a legacy software that created the user password field in your Active Directory, which literally stored the user password in clear. So you may actually found that one too. As I mentioned earlier, you don't necessarily need admin privileges to achieve all your predefined goal with your clients. So if it's an option, you can try and avoid it because most of the noise that you're going to make is to find the right person to have domain admin right at the beginning. So if you can avoid that part and just target the specific user you are, that you're looking for, it may actually save you from being detected. Um, unfortunately, Red Team and Real Life are a bit different because we're limited in time and budget, right? So the client is paying for your service, so sometimes we have to hack fast because we're just running out of budget or time. So we may have to take risky de decision, but you have to be careful and make sure that you're taking the risky decision for the right reason. Like as we mentioned earlier, migrating to Explorer is probably something that can be done fairly stealthy and may be extremely valuable for you. Uh, most Windows commands can be run through PowerShell. That's another thing. Most of the framework is just going to spawn CMD, but you can actually use unmanaged PowerShell to run typical CMD uh, commands such as netstat or stuff like that. So you can use PowerPick from Cobalt Strike or PowerShell support that by default. So at least you're not going to have event, hey, this command has been run, and you're not going to get uh, alerts for that. That's another goal. Uh, these are not super stealthy uh, trick, but way, 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 way useful. Uh, my favorite one is find local admin access. It's actually super noisy, but it's damn useful. Uh, the way it works is going to connect to all the assets and trying to see if the current user have access to the system with local admin privileges. It's so useful because you don't even have to find a local privilege escalation on your current system. If you don't want to, you can just move on to the next one where you actually privilege. So you don't even have to bother doing this. Uh, get net domain trust is actually super powerful too. You're going to get all the domains. So you may actually found cross domain policies that leak other users that are actually privileged in your own domain, even if you don't know about it. Same with the net first trust. You'll be surprised like how many bidirectional uh, trust we found all the time that are so useful. Invoke share finder. Looking for share with valuable information too is something that's really useful. And get net local group again. If you're looking for a local admin remote on, uh, remotely on a system, you can just ask the remote system to give you the list of everything that is considered a local admin. So it's going to include Active Directory group and local users that also have access to it. So this is something that's really useful. But unfortunately, they're mostly extremely noisy because they're going to connect to most systems and generate a lot of network traffic. So in conclusion, even if we try to be as stealthy as possible, there's no real way to exfiltrate data without creating some noise at some point. So you just have to choose your battle and decide, OK, I consider this specific part of my, uh, my action to be noisy, but they may seem legitimate from a network perspective. But when it's possible, trying to adapt your technique and your tool to remain as stealthy as possible with your clients. So again, I kind of give you some advice. I hope they're going to be useful for you in the future, especially if you're performing red team. But you can use these advice to actually uh, get more data without creating much noise. So a good phishing campaign make a difference. Trying to target your company, look at what they like. Uh, crafting a payload is in heart. So take your time. Don't rush yourself. Trying to learn. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote all of these tools. I just wanted to uh, have a better understanding. And the best way to learn is by doing it yourself. And again, try to avoid running PowerShell directly at all costs. I think I probably said that 20 times during the presentation. But that's a fact. It's really important to actually do that because it's easy to detect people that way. That's pretty much it for me. So hope you enjoy it. If you don't have any questions, I guess I'll take some now.